without further ado, I will welcome Linda and Vincent from Ava Women, and they will tell us what women want. Welcome, Linda and Vincent. Welcome to this talk. Uh, Vincent and I will be talking about how we at AVA have been using psych physiological data in order to design uh, fertility uh, detection algorithms for seeking and avoiding pregnancy. First, I will be talking a little about AVA, uh, what we do, and then I will try to explain how physiological signals can be used um, to determine a woman's fertile days. And finally, Vincent will take us on a deep dive into explaining why we need uh, more insights from data and domain knowledge in order to, to select a really good algorithm. So Eva is a Swiss company. It was founded in 2014. Um, we, um, some of you might know us already. We are, um, we are recognized, uh, we have ever alert uh, earned a lot of uh, different awards in, uh, in startup and in medtech. And one of the areas uh, specifically is femtech, which is uh, medtech for women, because our vision is to help women throughout their reproductive health, uh, lives with their reproductive health. So we have one variable device, which is the one you see on the picture. It's also here. Um, and this device is worn by women during the night. It collects... Uh, different physiological signals. It collects the heart rate, the heart rate variability, temperature, breathing rate, perfusion. We have currently uh, 200,000 users, and each night they collect um, each one million data point. And all these data we use for various apps. We have the first one is the Fertility app that was launched in Europe in 2016. And last year it was also approved by the FDA and on the market in US. And what we're working on currently is a contraception app, um, which will be launching next year in Europe. And how is, uh, for, how is fertility determined? Well, everything comes down to hormones. So the ovulation is controlled by hormones. And in the picture here, you see um, one cycle of a woman. Uh, the x-axis is uh, the time. So this shows one cycle, and then somewhere in the middle you have uh, the ovulation. Up the x-axis we have different levels of hormones. And what we are interested in finding is the day of the ovulation and the five days leading up to ovulation, because these are the days in, in the cycle where a woman can get pregnant. So for both our apps, for the, where we want to help women get pregnant, and for where we want to help women avoid a pregnancy, we want to identify this so-called fertile window. Um, so this can be done, uh, the ovulation can be found uh, traditionally uh, uh, in different ways, or typically in different ways. Uh, either you can go to a doctor and make an ultrasound, but that's not really a feasible solution if you want to do that every cycle in order to find out when your ovulation occurs. Another method is to use the luthanizing hormone. You can see the gray curve is peaking. The luthanizing hormone is peaking right before ovulation. And this can be detected in the urine. So you can make a so-called LH test. And when that is positive, you know that ovulation is about to occur. Another method is also quite old and very famous, is the morning temperature. That uh, you know that there is a small rise in the morning temperature when a woman has had her ovulation. However, the problem with all of these methods is that we don't want just to detect the ovulation because that's practically too late, especially if we're working with contraception. Because when the ovulation has occurred, you have already had your fertile days. So we can, it's good for detecting when the fertile window closes, but in order to find out when it opens, we need other methods. So how do we do that at AVA? You see almost the same picture here, but instead of the, the hormone levels, you see now the physiological signals. So the physiological signals I mentioned earlier that we are collecting. And again, throughout the cycle, these varies. And you see here the, pur the purple one is uh, the temperature, and you see it rises slightly after the ovulation. 
But in order to also find when the window starts, we need to look at all of the signals together. And how do we then construct a machine learning algorithm for this? Well, we have our physiological data. We put that into a model. And in order to train a model, we need some labels. We can use the LH uh, positive tests because we are looking at historical data. So in order to train a model, we can use the LH labels and then count backwards retrospectively to find when the uh, fertile window happened. So now we have our input, we have our labels, we find some kind of machine learning architecture, and then out comes, for every day in a cycle, comes an indication of whether a woman is fertile or not fertile. In this illustration, it's shown that uh, the fertile days are the red ones, and the non-fertile days are the green ones. In the background, you see the lighter color, they represent the truth, and in the foreground, you see uh, the stronger colors represent the prediction from the model. So in this case, um, we found the entire fertile window. This would be a really good case if we were to make an app for contraception. Because for a contraception app, we don't want to misclassify any of the true fertile days. If we, however, wanted to make an app for conception, we might want to have a smaller fertile window because we sort of want to save the power for fewer days. So we might want to have more green days in the red window, so make the other type of error. And this is the typical trade-off between sensitivity and accuracy, or said in other words, when you are decreasing one type of error, you are increasing the other type of error. So with that, this is just a binary classification problem, and we can switch between the two different models by just uh, putting up and down these different kinds of error. So it's just a binary classification problem, right? Fertile or not on any given day. Fortunately for us data scientists at Ava, however, the problem's actually quite a bit more interesting than that. Let me get into a couple of the complexities that we see in this case. So firstly, while only the fertile days in any given cycle carry a non-negligible chance of conception, the conception probability is not uniform throughout this fertile window. It starts relatively low, about five days before ovulation, and it increases day on day until it reaches its maximum on the day of ovulation itself. This actually has important ramifications for us when we're designing our algorithms. If we're designing an algorithm for contraception, for example, which is supposed to be telling women when to avoid having unpro unprotected sex if they want to avoid pregnancy, then it's much better to misclassify days at the beginning of the fertile window than at the end, because it's these days at the beginning that carry a relatively lower risk of unwanted pregnancy. It's also the same case if we're designing algorithms for conception. In the conception use case, we still want to target these latter three days of the fertile window so that our users have more bang for their buck, shall we say. A second complication is that both the signals data and the outcome, the fertility status that we're trying to predict, are serially dependent. In particular, we expect that our model should produce a minimum of at least six consecutive days per cycle. We want a fertile window of six consecutive days. This means that we really should be forcing the model to respect this structure and output continuous fertile windows, ideally of a minimum length. Additionally, we should keep in mind that a woman can become pregnant at most once per cycle. A third and final point that I'd like to touch upon here is the fact that we've trained our algorithm using dates that come from LH tests. As Linda was telling us, the presence of luteinizing hormone in the female body peaks before ovulation. But it's not always the case that ovulation occurs on the day immediately following that LH peak, which is the assumption that we have used in the training data. In fact, ovulation can occur on the same day that this LH peak is recorded, or even up to three days after it has been recorded. So here are some of the complications. How do we address them? Let's make things a little bit more concrete by diving really into the contraception use case. So again, just to remind you, the goal here is to design an algorithm that tells our users when they should avoid having unprotected sex. The red is saying, not today. So we have a trained model that classifies whether a user is fertile or not by outputting per day fertility probabilities. We can massage these daily fertility probabilities into probabilities that the fertile window has opened and also that it is closed. This takes care of having a coherent, continuous fertile window. So we're now in a position where we can set cutoff thresholds that determine when the fertile window opens 
and when it closes. We have two thresholds in this problem, opening and closing of the fertile window. As previously mentioned, we want to maximize for sensitivity in the contraception use case, since this is a measure of safety, while at the same time, we don't want to label just every single day as fertile, um, because that's more than a little bit dumb and doesn't actually result in something that's useful. If we would use the, receive, the usual receiver operating characteristic method, for example, for calibrating our thresholds, then we'd be glossing over the subtleties of the problem that we've just discussed, in particular that some days in the fertile window are more fertile than others. To illustrate the point, let's have a look at these three cases that are depicted on the slide, each of which depict a situation, uh, a, a situation where the model opens and closes the fertile window in a menstrual cycle. I've taken a little bit of artistic license here by displaying cycles that are 20 days long, this is atypically short, and the length of a menstrual cycle, the lengths of different menstrual cycles vary quite a bit, even for the same woman, but let's gloss over that for now. It's just a picture. So in these pictures, the lighter colors, as before, indicate the ground truth fertility status, with red indicating fertile and green indicating not fertile. And the bolder colors indicate what our model is outputting. In each case, there is a fertile window spanning cycle days 12 to 17 inclusive. In the bottom diagram, we would have a thresholded model that predicts a fertile window from day 9 to day 15. In the middle diagram, the model predicts a fertile window from cycle day 14 to cycle day 20. Thinking in the contraception use case, which of these two is better? Well, they both have the same sensitivity, as four out of six fertile days are correctly identified. However, from a contraception point of view, the middle case, I think you'll agree, is vastly preferable to the bottom one because in the bottom case, we are misclassifying the most fertile days of all. Whereas in the middle case, yes, we are misclassifying some fertile days, but they are the ones that have the least chance of unwanted pregnancy. Better still, from a safety point of view, however, would be the top diagram, which has a perfect sensitivity, covers the entire fertile window, but it does this at the expense of misclassifying more not fertile days. The scenario depicted at the top is more safe, but arguably less fun than the one in the middle. Right? So we want to reach a high threshold of safety, i.e. minimize the risk of unwanted pregnancy, but also make it fun for our users. How can we design, how can we, how can we choose thresholds that, preferen that preference either the top or the middle case to the bottom one? Well, the answer is to use better metrics. So we've seen that model thresholds, we saw on the previous slide that model thresholds, thresholded models with the same sensitivity are not all equal. And again, this comes down to the fact that the fertile days are not all the same. If we fix thresholds for opening and closing the fertile window, we can actually estimate a cumulative pregnancy rate that takes into account all of the information in the problem. And we want to do this so that we get a better idea of how safe our thresholded model would be. So this, we want this to replace sensitivity. So we have cycles that are labeled with the results of positive LH tests. For each day of the cycle, the probability of conception on that day is a function of how far away that day is from the true date that ovulation occurred. We don't know the true date that ovulation occurred. We know when the LH test said that ovulation occurred. And the date that true ovulation occurred is a function of when that LH test result came back positive, and it follows a probability distribution that's centered one day after. That's what we see at the bottom right here of the screen. Combining these two probabilities, we get an estimate for the probability of conception on any given day in a cycle that carries an LH, a positive LH test result on a particular day. So this is a per-day conception probability. Using these per-day conception probabilities, we can get an estimate of the probability of conception in any given labeled cycle by running our thresholded model. So again, we've chosen thresholds. We run it on user data. We get outputs for fertility or not fertility on every given day of the cycle. Now, here is where we make some assumptions. So we assume that the user never has unprotected sex when the model says that she is fertile. We assume that she always has unprotected sex when the model says that she is not fertile. Exhausting, I know, but bear with me. And taking into account the fact that a woman can become pregnant at most once per cycle, the probability of conception in a labeled cycle is 1 minus the probability of not becoming pregnant on any day on which intercourse occurred. This formula the formula that describes this is at the bottom of the screen here. So this formula here for the probability of conception in a labeled cycle builds in all of our assumptions. Uncertainty in the ovulation date, 
the, difference, uh, the differences of the conception probabilities throughout the fertile window. And combining these per cycle probabilities for all of the labeled cycles in our calibration data set, we can get an estimated cumulative pregnancy rate. This metric is a function of the calibration thresholds that gives a measure of our algorithm safety. And again, it explicitly takes into, the, into account the fact that a woman can get pregnant at most once per cycle, not all fertile days carry the same conception probability, and that our ground truth labels, our ground truth LH labels only determine the true ovulation date up to probability. So this is actually much more informative for us than a raw sensitivity score. All right, so that's the safety side of the equation. The other side of the coin is fun. So we want to maximize safety, but we also want this thing to be fun to use, otherwise we don't have a product. And our measurement of fun is the Green Day ratio, what we call the Green Day ratio. This estimates the proportion of days in any given cycle that the model declares as not fertile. For this, we simply average the proportion of not fertile days that the thresholded model produces over every cycle. So that, just as an aside, the reason that we call this the Green Day ratio comes from the fact that we're thinking of a not fertile fertility prediction from the model as a green light for unprotected sex on that day. Think of, think of a traffic light, green and red. The Green Day ratio is then our metric that represents how fun the thresholded model is. Okay, so we have a metric for safety, we have a metric for fun. What do we do now? Well, here's our calibration recipe. We start with our trained model. So this is outputting some probabilities. We want to set thresholds for it. First, what we can do is we find interesting, interesting collections of fertile window opening and closing thresholds that have some kind of discriminat discriminative power. We then restrict to those threshold pairs that together result in a model with a specified minimum of 99.2% sensitivity. So this is actually a very, very high sensitivity because we really want this product to be quite safe. For each of those threshold pairs, we then estimate the metrics that we just discussed, the pregnancy rate and the Green Day ratio. Next, we plot pregnancy rates against Green Day ratios with each pair of thresholds contributing one point to the plot. So on this plot, the x-axis is the estimated pregnancy rate and the y-axis is the Green Day ratio. And what we would like to do is we would like to identify the threshold pair that is preferentially at the top, so we maximize our Green Day ratio and toward the left so that we minimize our estimated pregnancy rate. Let's zoom in on this picture and sort of understand what's going on in different segments of it. Let's go anti-clockwise. So starting from the left and the bottom, we see here thresholded models that have quite low estimated cumulative pregnancy rates, but not really that great Green Day ratios. So what's happening here? Well, typically, we're going to be very, very, very safe at the expense of not being at all that fun. Let's, let's rule these two cases out. What about on the right-hand side? On the right-hand side, our Green Day ratio is higher. Um, but our estimated, our estimated pregnancy rate is also fairly high. So what that means, given the overall sensitivity constraint, is that when we are misclassifying fertile days, we tend to misclassify them toward the end of the fertile window in this, in this place that we really don't want to be. So let's rule that out also. Now looking at the top, this is where we want to be, because here we have a good Green Day ratio, we have a lower estimated cumulative pregnancy rate, and that means that when we are misclassifying fertile days, we tend to be doing them at the beginning of the fertile window. So by specifically choosing thresholds that land us in this top region, we get a contraception algorithm that strikes this optimum balance between safety and fun. Right, so let me shortly summarize what we have uh, learned in this talk. So we have learned that uh, it's not just a binary classification problem, we have we need to take into, all, into account all of the, the information that uh, we have in our data. And uh, as you saw, one of them is that uh, red days, some red days or some fertile days are more fertile than others. And also that we have to take the time into consideration because if one day is fertile, then the next day cannot be non-fertile and then fertile again, you have to have one connected window. And um, also, uh, that we have the uncertainty in the true labels. Um, just a second. Um, and I just wanted to say what we haven't seen here is, um, is all the other stuff around it. This is just our score. So we haven't at all talked about um, all the other challenges that we face. We have to have data in our model. So we haven't been talking about feature selection, signal processing, outlier detection, and all of that. And also, of course, not how to construct, how to design uh, um, machine learning ar architecture for this. But uh, that's for next time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hey, Linda. Hey, Vincent. What a start to this session. I learned a lot. Uh, Trade-off of fun and safety. Uh, new, new to me. Um, 
We have questions, five minutes. Uh, please, yes. Uh, guys, we're coming with a microphone. Please wait one second so the listeners online can also hear your questions. Thanks, a very interesting. Uh, I'm happy to see work uh, in Femtech area. And the, the question I had, did you consider involving the user in the risk score? So you could, do you have something like an option, like I feel very risky, I want to have the much funds possible, but maybe have a higher risk, but somebody else wants to be like really safe? Not yet, but that is definitely, that's a good idea actually. <laughs> but uh, yeah, currently it's just one algorithm fits all. It's a very interesting idea, you know, yeah. choose your risk profile, how? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> More question over there. Um, just, just for the fun, my wife is using a product. It's a great product to have. I'm the happy father of three daughters, and we don't want four. And I, it just <laughs> prevented me to have surgery. So great stuff. Um, I think from a marketing perspective, you could market a little bit more uh, men or couples, because for us, it was kind of couple decision, just for, uh, for you to know. My question um, is related to the, the data quality. What I saw looking at her using your product is sometimes the wearable fails during night and I was wondering can you cope with that can you still guarantee prediction quality even if the wearable fails sometime or, or for some hours that is that is what we haven't touched upon at all in this talk right is is how do we actually come from the signals collected into something that we can put into an algorithm and of course there's a lot of uh, constraints there and we have to do a lot of outlier detections as I said and filtering so so yeah, we accommodate for a lot of that, but of course, if we really can't predict anything from the data, then we will have we have a fallback scenario saying that then we just go safe. Yeah. But but no, it is no fun then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it it is an excellent point, and it is something that we spend a lot of our time thinking about. Mm. There were many more questions. I think he was next. Sorry. Thanks. I have a question. Um, when you calibrate your algorithm, it is based on many different women, and uh, the idea is that the patterns are, are, are well, uh, mostly, well, the same, or you understand the patterns, but there might be also some women that have maybe some extreme behavior, and maybe the, the prediction wouldn't work, and the, the consequences would be also very high. So there is on one side a technical aspect, on the other side also a communication aspect because I think that every woman thinks maybe she's very special, as maybe a very special uh, uh, kind of, of cycle. How you deal with that, uh, with the risk of very, I don't know, uh, special profiles? Well, we, ha we have a lot of uh, that built into the, the contraception app that we're going to launch because we, we have to have uh, risk mitigation strategies strategies for that. For example, if, if you're outside of what is normal in, in your cycle length, then the product is not for you to use. And, and, uh, so, and there's a lot of other constraints as well. So, so we do make uh, a, a lot of um, requirements in order for, for the woman to, to use the product. And that is something that we are very upfront about. Also, I mean, if, if she buys the product and finds out it's not for her, then yeah, she should return it. Just to pick up on that, so to a certain extent, some of these things are, I mean, we, the story that we told you today was a sort of very specific view, but um, some of these factors we do try to explicitly address in the design of the algorithm, and to the extent that we are unable to deal with them, there is a sort of process in the app for informing the user that, that you know, it's, we can't do anything with this data. The um, one last question, I, I hear we're really out okay, of time. Okay, I have the mic, so <laughs> yes, I go for it. <laughs> so, okay, thanks a lot. I have one question on the feedback loop. So I um, assume the, you have uh, 200k users. Um, so how, you, how good is the quality of feedback, I think, in the end, then after one and a half months, or when you see that the woman is pregnant, you have to uh, estimate, okay, when was it at the fun day, maybe? And you know what I mean. So how good is the feedback loop? You want to take that? Um, well, so th the first thing that I would say is that um, the contraception product is not yet online, so we don't have that, that process set up. We're actually currently in the, in the process of building this feedback loop to try to understand, okay, you know, when, when something happens, how do we analyze where things went wrong? Um, this is something that we're actively thinking about, yeah. I mean, just to sort of on the other side of that, of that coin, the product that we do have in the market, the conception one, Pregnancy is the, is the goal that we want, and if pregnancy doesn't occur, then we sort of get that feedback by continued user use. 
And we also have a feedback in the data, so to say, because we use the history of the woman's uh, her, her signals and her, and her cycle length. We use that as uh, to, to calibrate her results, of course. Perfect. Hey, thank you very much, Vincent and Linda. Uh, one more round of applause for our speakers today.